Well, hey, it's wonderful to be here with you today. I want to just begin by thanking Matt Henderson for preaching a few weeks ago, and then uh, two weeks ago, I thank you to Shan and Lisa for bringing a great message on marriage and parenting and honoring God at work. Uh, Last week, I was supposed to be with you in person to wrap up the Colossians series, but I could not get out of bed. I had a 103-degree fever. I couldn't speak. And so on Saturday morning, I texted Emerson. I said, brother, you've got to bring the word for our people. And he did not disappoint. With 24 hours notice, he preached a great message. We're so thankful for so many great people who lead here, uh, who, who, who steward the pulpit. And I know the Lord has spoken in some great way through the Colossians series, and I'm excited to kick off this brand new series. I've lost 10 pounds, so I'm not going to carry any extra weight. It was a bad illness, but I've had a lot of time, uh, really, the last three weeks to just pray and prepare my heart and to meet with the Lord about what I think he wants to communicate to us as a church in this new seven-week series. So to kick it off, I want to ask you what I believe is a very important question. And it might be particularly relevant and pressing because of the season of life you're in. Maybe you're a guest here. Maybe this is your first, second, third time at the church, and you're trying to figure this out for yourself. Or maybe you have others who have just changed uh, cities or they're exploring a new church home. And here is the question I want you to consider. How should a person or a family determine if a church they're visiting should become their church home? How should a person figure out if a congregation should be a place that they place membership and officially become a part of? Now, obviously, if you are checking out a church and you're exploring that question, and as you're walking in, you hear God audibly speak, place your membership, then, you know, it's, it's determined. Like, this is what you should do. But Sands, hearing James Earl Jones' mag- magnificent voice come over the PA and giving you specific direction, how should a person determine if they should join a congregation and make it their faith family? Should they consider how close it is in proximity to their home? Because it would be you know, convenient and easier to attend and participate in body life. Should they evaluate how many friends they have who already go to the church so it's easier to integrate into community? Should they check out the children's ministry and the student ministry to see if there's a, a vibrant next-gen movement where God is drawing young people to, uh, to, to follow him passionately all the days of their life? Should they evaluate you know, how, how quality the music is and if it's of their per, per personal preference to see if they really resonate with, with the songs? Should they make sure the preaching is biblical and when they leave they feel inspired and built up in their, in their, in their faith and their theology and they feel equipped for mission? Should they see what a good job they do at raising up leaders and empowering people to to share their faith? Should they count how many baptisms there were to make sure that people are regularly responding to Jesus? I mean, there's so many different questions that a person could reasonably consider when they're evaluating if they should make a church their home. One of the things that I think is very important that I very irregularly hear people evaluate when they're trying to figure out their church home is how a church goes about making disciples, which is essentially what a church is, is about. So unfortunately, one of, the, one of the most important things a church can ever do is uh, almost neglected in the evaluation process for many. Dallas Willard, one of my favorite authors, says the two most important questions about a church, the two most important questions anyone could ever ask, how does that church make disciples And is it working? How do they make disciples? Is it working? As a church, we want to do everything we possibly can to make disciples of Jesus Christ. A disciple is a student. It is a learner. It's someone who is sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning to look, live, and love more like him. We believe that Jesus is not just the Son of God. He's not just Lord and Savior, but he is the ultimate example for every person. Jesus lived a life of ceaseless intimacy with his heavenly father and perpetual selfless love for everyone he interacted with. He embodied love and truth, compassion and justice, holiness and and mercy in the most perfect of all possible ways. And we are trying in every aspect of our lives to become more like him. Now, as a church, we have what we call a formation pathway which means that as people participate in the life of this church, that they would engage in all these different opportunities that we set forth, and through engagement in those opportunities, there would be formation into the image of Jesus. 
And that formation pathway, it includes things like coming to, to church on a Sunday, hearing the word of God preached, receiving communion, responding with song, being sent out on mission. It involves not just weekend worship, but midweek life group participation, being in homes, opening the scriptures, praying, and being accountable uh, with one another. It involves attending classes where we learn more about the scriptures and theology in greater depth. It involves leadership development. It involves prayer experiences. It's a very holistic, robust formation pathway. And we believe that as people engage with it, like truly engage with it, not just come to church on Sunday and go back home, but like engage with the entire thing that we're doing, we believe we really will make disciples. But then the question still is, 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 is set before us. What kind of disciple are you making? Well, you know that we're not just a church in the 317, but a church for the 317. We say that we have a threefold mission, love God, love people, make disciples. We have a singular vision. The one is to connect people to Jesus. And then we have seven priorities. And as a church, those priorities not only shape the decisions we make, but they inform the disciples that we're attempting to make as well. Our seven priorities as a church, this is the series that we are in, the priorities that shape us are worship, gospel, kingdom, scripture, identity, community, and generosity. These seven priorities, they shape our macro-level decisions, and they also inform the disciples that we are trying to to make here as a church, meaning that if you participate in the life of, of this congregation, not just for months, but for years, and you engage in all that we try to offer, we want this to become the quality of your life. And over the next seven weeks, as we unpack this series on the priorities that shape us, we're going to talk about each one of those and how we can uh, pursue them, how we can uh, prioritize them so that we can all look, live, and love more like Jesus as individuals, and then very importantly, as a faith family. So let's begin today by talking about our lead priority, worship. We want to talk about worship. Now the entire Bible is a document about worship. So there's hundreds of passages that we could go to to talk about worship, but I want to ask you to turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and we're going to see a beautiful picture into the life of worship of a woman by the name of Mary. Now, Mary had a sister named Martha, and the two of them had the privilege of welcoming Jesus to their house one day. And the way Mary responds is a great picture for worship, I believe is an example for us and a great inspiration. So Luke chapter 10, you can read, if you'd like, in your laps as your Bibles are open, but the text is also here on the screen. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So in this passage, we see two women, two sisters, Martha and Mary, and they have the privilege of welcoming Jesus to their house. Martha is doing a good thing here. Out of her love for Jesus and out of her commitment to Christian hospitality, she has welcomed Jesus and all of his disciples into her home. And as such, she is preparing her house to be a fitting place for them to stay. She is preparing food. She is cooking. She's setting the table. But in the midst of it all, Jesus looks at her, doing a very good thing, and says that you are worried and upset. This phrase, worried and upset, in Greek means to be dragged away and pulled apart. Martha, you're doing good things. You've welcomed me into your house. You're preparing food. You're getting the table set. But in the midst of it all, you are being dragged away and pulled apart. God himself is in your midst. And though you're doing lots of important things, you've forgotten to prioritize the presence of God in your midst. As such, instead of being focused 
she was fragmented. And I believe that is the case for a large percentage of Christians who want to welcome the presence of Jesus into their life. They perhaps want to begin their day with some time in prayer, their time reading a few chapters of the scripture. They want to begin their week with worship. They know that Jesus is important. They want to prioritize his presence, but then we get worried and upset. We get uh, distracted and, and pulled away by all the other important things that have to be going on. Yes, of course I want to honor the presence of Jesus, but there's also kids that need to be fed, and they start making a lot of noise if they don't get their food. Yes, of course I want to honor the presence of Jesus, but the lawn needs to be mowed, and it turns into a jungle if it doesn't have its attention. Yes, of course I want to honor the presence of Jesus and recognize how important he is and stay focused on him, but I also have this thing called a job that I have to go to, and I've got responsibilities, and I've got emails, and I've got my fantasy football team, and I've, I've got to go to the grocery store, and... There's so many things in life. And Jesus is, like Martha, Jesus is in our presence, like he, he dwells inside of us. We're not ignoring him entirely, but we get fragmented. We get dragged away. We get pulled apart. But Mary was able to, instead of being fragmented, to stay focused. Instead of being dragged away, she was able to be devoted. And Jesus and speaking about Mary, said few things are needed, or indeed only one. And Mary chose what mattered most. It's a beautiful vignette of the heart of worship. Sometimes we can think about worship as if the most important thing we can do is to put God at the very top of the priorities in our life. You could look at a, perhaps a long list like this and we say we all have got family and we have those responsibilities and then work and friends and hobbies and entertainment and chores and errands and, and finances and this whole thing. But worship means that God reigns supreme, that God comes first, that God is number one. And I don't think this is necessarily a bad way to think about worship. God should always come number one. But on occasion, if we approach our understanding of worship where God is at the top of the list, then once we tend to God, once we begin our week by coming to church, once we begin our day with a few moments in prayer or whatever that looks like for you, we can tend to almost put that on the back burner and then get to other things that are really pressing and demanding and we end up being dragged away and pulled apart and living a fragmented rather than a focused life of worship. What if instead of thinking about worship as putting God at the top of the list, we thought instead about God being at the very center of our lives? And with God at the center comes family and work and friends and hobbies and entertainment and chores and errands and finances. And it's not we check this box and then we move on. But there is a controlling center in our lives. God is that controlling center. And then with God at the center, we do anything and everything else. Here's how we like to define worship here at the creek as one of our priorities. Worship means we seek God's presence and honor in everything we do. We don't just put God first, we place him at the center. And with God at the center, we seek his presence and his honor in all things. Now, we have used that story of Jesus and Mary from Luke 10 as a launching off pad. Now what I wanna do is take us to three different Psalms, three different textbooks on worship, if you will. And what we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna see three different important aspects of a worshipful life, and each are described with a single word. Here's the first word that we're going to look at. It is the word delight. Worshipful disciples are those who delight in God and in being in his presence. Those who, like Mary, know that there is no better place to be. There's no more worthy or valuable thing to do than tend to God. And uh, to unpack that, I want to ask you to turn to Psalm 16 in your Bibles. Psalm 16 is a master class in delight. It's a longer psalm. We're not going to read the whole thing right now. I'd encourage you to read it later on this week, but I want to highlight some of the verses in Psalm 16 for you. For example, Psalm 16, verse 2, you are my God. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Verse 5, Lord, you alone are my portion. Verse 8, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. Verse 11, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
This is the heart cry of a person who sincerely delights in God. I have a three-year-old little girl named Addie Hope. She turned three just on Thursday. I can't even put into words how much I love and treasure this, this, this gift that God has given me. One of the challenging things about raising my daughter is her lack of interest in eating her dinner. Now, I have a four-year-old son and a one-and-a-half-year-old son who bookend my daughter, so boy, girl, boy. And my two sons have voracious appetites. My oldest son, I'd expect him to eat more than my daughter, but even my younger son eats more than my daughter. That's not like my daughter is gaunt. I mean, she is like a, a normal weight. But I can put a double portion in front of Hudson and in front of Luke, and a half portion in front of Addie. And both of my sons will be done with their meal before Addie has even taken three bites. I can put, give them all their food, walk away for a few moments, and come back, and my, my son's food is gone. Some of it's on the floor, some of it's on the ceiling, but it's gone. But my daughter, it can take her 45 minutes, it can take her an hour. It is like pulling teeth, pleading with her to eat her food. And that's the case almost every night in the Hamill household. But I noticed something interesting on Thursday night, which was her third birthday, and we placed cake in front of her. We did not have to beg her to eat it. She ran to it. She ingested it. She consumed it. And she went back again and again and again. There is a difference from eating her dinner, which seemed like a chore, and consuming her cake, which seemed like a joy. You see what I'm saying about the Lord? This is what, what we read in Psalm 34. Taste and see that the Lord is good. God invites every person to experience the greatness that is God himself, to see how satisfying, to see how rewarding and rich he truly is. God does not want you to live vicariously through the Yelp reviews of other users. He wants you to set a reservation, and he wants you to dine with him and to see how rich and satisfying he and he alone can be. Almost every other religion in the world is going to tell you more or less that this is the narrative that you need to follow. There is a God who is real and powerful, therefore I should obey him. That's what religion teaches. Now you can come up with a hundred different names for the religions and their God will be called by, you know, a different surname. And the things you have to do to honor him and obey him will be distinct as well. But this is the essence of all religion. Christianity, it it shakes the shell of religion and like metamorphosizes into an entirely different type of encounter where the narrative is now there is a God who is real and powerful but also loving and beautiful. Therefore, it is my heart's desire to pursue and worship him. That's delight. And there's a pastor who I've been reading and listening to for over 20 years now. His name is John Piper. And when John Piper, who's been in ministry for about 50 years, he says that when he is in the baptistry taking the confession of a person who wants to enter into the Christian faith, he got to the point in ministry where he no longer asked them if they believe in Jesus. He said it's unfortunate, but the word belief has become too benign of, the, of a word. It's too vague. It's too general. For some people, it just means like cognitive assent. And he said, I, I needed to find a word that got at the heart of what's really going on when a person decides to become a Christian. He said, I no longer ask someone if they believe in Jesus. I now ask them if Jesus is their treasure. I want to get at the heart of delight. Jesus told a story about this in Matthew chapter 13. He was telling a parable. It's a really brief story, but he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and then covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. You see in this story, that's, it's a man who is working a field. He uncovers a treasure, and immediately he goes and he liquidates all of his assets, and he leverages everything everything he has in order to be able to buy the field so he could acquire that treasure. Nobody had to guilt him into selling other things to get the treasure. No one had to twist his arm behind his back and manipulate him 
into selling his things to buy that treasure. He knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that that treasure was worth infinitely more than everything else he had in his life combined in terms of value and worth. And what Jesus wants us to realize, just like he, in his joy, went and sold it all so that he could have the kingdom, there's nothing in all of our lives combined that holds a candle to the infinite worth of Jesus Christ. And so it is our great delight to pursue him. It is our great delight to be in his presence. It is our great delight to live our lives for his glory. God is not only real, he's beautiful, he is good, and in his presence is the fullness of joy. At his right hand are eternal pleasures forevermore. The first word is delight from Psalm 16. The second word I want to give you is desire. Desire. Flip a few pages over to Psalm 63. We're going to look at Psalm 63 together, the first five verses. That which we delight in, we naturally desire more of. And we want to be a church that is filled with disciples who desire God from the core of our being. Psalm 63, you, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. This is not the testimony of a man who has to be dragged to church by his wife. This is a man who is not going through the motions and checking boxes off of his list of obligations. This is a man driven by desire. Look at his statements again. He says, earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. I will praise you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. These are not the muted expressions of a conservative Puritan. These are the exclamations of a hedonist. Someone who loves pleasure and extravagance and excess, but has found that pleasure and extravagance and excess is found chiefly in the presence and the glory of God. And I want to remind you who wrote Psalm 63. It wasn't a monk hanging out in the wilderness for years on end just singing Kumbaya. It was King David. King David writes in this psalm, Your love, O God, is better than life. And I want you to think about all that King David had experienced to still be able to say, your love, O God, is better than life. He was the king, after all. He had more wealth than anyone in the entire nation, but though having all the money he could ever dream of, he said, your love, O God, is better than life. It wasn't just money. He had power. He had more influence and control than anyone else in all the land, and having all the control that was possible in the land. He was king. He wasn't a president who was voted. He was a king. He still said, your love, O God, is better than life. He didn't just have wealth and power. He had fame. He had the adoration of the people. There were young maidens and women in the streets that sang of his exploits, that declared his greatness. And still, he said, your love, O God, is better than life. Sinfully, as king, he pursued relationships with many women. He had had as much physical pleasure as a man could ever experience in life. And yet, having experienced that road of attempted satisfaction, he still ended up saying, it is your love, O God, that is better than life. He's not just a man who had delight in God. He desired God chiefly above all else. C.S. Lewis put it this way, it would seem that our Lord finds our desire not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition, when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And heartbreakingly, I believe that is the experience of many Christians. 
we go throughout our religious experience thinking that Christianity is about do's and don'ts. It's not about do's and don'ts, it's about desire. It's not about us, you know, working up religious commitment and saying, I, I, I will do this and I won't do this. It's about saying, I want this. My desire is for God. Now, George Mueller is a, a well-known Christian leader, one of the most influential Christians of the entire 19th century. Lived in Great Britain, was a devout Christian, and in his early years became incredibly burdened by the plight of orphans in the land. He had um, a desire and carried it out to start an orphanage to care for these orphans, provide the, su the support that they needed. But he also believed that as a Christian, he should not go to other people or go to the government and beg for money and ask for handouts. Every need that he had or that his orphanage had, he believed he should pray for and just trust God to provide. That orphanage he built ended up in his lifetime caring for more than 10,000 young people without parents. And then he went on to start schools. He started over 100 schools that in his lifetime cared for more than 120,000 kids, all without asking for a dime from anyone besides on his knees asking God. His life, his faith indelibly shaped the, the, the trajectory of, of his entire country. And George Mueller said this, one of my favorite quotes from him, my first duty every day is to make myself happy in God. It's not just about delight, it's about desire. That is the heart of worship that God desires from his people. So we begin with delight, we progress to desire, which ultimately moves us towards desperation. When we truly delight in something and we have an intense desire for that thing, we will eventually have a growing sense of desperation for it. A passionate, life-consuming connection with God is not just something that we want to have. It's something that we get to the point that we must have. Now I want you to turn to Psalm 42, just a few pages back, and listen to what we read in the first two verses of Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? The words in this psalm picture a deer in the peak of the heat of summer, beat down by the scorching sun, who finds itself in drought condition, panting, desperate to find a stream of water to be satisfied and restored. And then the psalmist says, that's how my soul thirsts for God. It's not just delight, it's not just desire, it's desperation. God, more than anything else in this universe, I need you. I have to have you. There are two stories in the Bible that I think encapsulate this, this desperation so well. One from the New Testament and one from the Old. In John chapter 6, we see that Jesus is now two years into his public ministry and has grown in his fame and his notoriety. He has, at this point, done a lot of teaching and people were, were drawn to the words that he spoke. Wisdom unlike they'd ever heard before. And he'd also performed dozens of miracles. It was power, unlike people had ever witnessed before. And so in John chapter 6, we get to the point where we see that he, there are 5,000 men who are sitting there, standing at attention, listening to his words, soaking every one of them up. Most scholars extrapolate, if there's 5,000 men, then you add women and children, probably 12,000 people in the crowd, plus or minus. And these 12,000 people are listening to his words, and then after hours, they start getting hungry, and Jesus says, why don't we provide for them? He asks his disciples for help. They find a boy that's got five loaves and two fish, and he takes them, and he prays, he, he blesses them, and, and then he ends up feeding you know, this mass, you know, 10,000 plus people, all with just that small meal, and they witness it all. They want to make him king by force that day, but Jesus slips out from their midst, and, and yet they go and they find him the next day, and like they are... They're hungry for Jesus. But Jesus says, no, you're not hungry for me. You're just hungry for more food. And I'm telling you, you need to work for bread. Not that will leave you hungry in a few hours. You need, to, you need to work for the bread that comes down from heaven that you can eat and you'll be satisfied for eternity. 
And the people agree, yes, yes, give us this bread. And then Jesus says, I am the bread that's come down from heaven, and you need to eat my flesh. And then he says, and you need, you need to drink my blood. It's important to know that Jesus is speaking metaphorically here. He wasn't actually talking about cannibalism here. I think, I think we get that. But he is saying, you need to center your life on me. You need to make me the highest priority. I need to become that, that, that consuming core that everything else you do flows from. I need to be the all-consuming center of your life. And after Jesus said that, when he raised the bar and clarified what discipleship was really all about, those 12,000 people, one by one, began to go away. It didn't matter the words that he had taught with wisdom before. It didn't matter the miracles that they'd witnessed. One, just the previous day, they weren't ready for that level of commitment. They weren't ready to worship him that way. 12,000 dwindles down to just 12. I mean, there's, there's this mass exodus, people running for the doors. And then Jesus looks at his original disciples, the ones who've been with him the longest, and he says, what about you? Do you want to go too? And to that sincere question, Peter speaks on behalf of the disciples, and he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus, we've tried other options. We've knocked on other doors. We've pursued other paths. You are the only one that has the words of eternal life. There's a sense of desperation in their commitment to Jesus. From the Old Testament, I want to talk about the life of Moses. Uh, many of you are familiar with the story of the Exodus, but I'll just surmise it in just about 30 seconds. God's people, over a million strong, had been enslaved in the country of Egypt for over 400 years. They were brutally oppressed there, and they cried out to God for deliverance. And the, the Bible says that God heard their cry. He raised up a man named Moses, had miraculous circumstances throughout his early life. He has 40 years of preparation in the wilderness, and then God sends him back to Egypt and speaks to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. Through God's hand, he ends up performing these 10 miracles. Finally, Pharaoh taps out. He relents. He allows God's people to flee Egypt. They get to the Red Sea. They walk through the Red Sea on dry ground with a wall of water on either side. The Lord leads them to Mount Sinai where his presence descends. He gives the Ten Commandments. He enters into a type of covenant with these people, the Israelite people, the people he made a promise to generations before through Abraham, Isaac, and through, through Jacob. And right then, as the Lord is still speaking to Moses and giving direction and clarification about how the Israelites are supposed to worship him, right in that moment, the people turn away with their adulterous hearts. They fashion for themselves uh, an, an idol, this, this golden calf, and they start prostrating themselves before. They start worshiping this calf, saying it was the calf that brought them up out of Egypt. And God looks at the situation, and after a number of exchanges between God and Moses and the people, God says, look, I'm going to send you up to the promised land. And there, instead of being slaves under Egypt, you will have your freedom. And you'll be in a land flowing with milk and honey. It won't be making brick without straws. You'll have everything you need in abundance and excess. You'll be your own nation. But I won't be with you. Your hearts are too wicked, too idolatrous. I'm not going to go with you. And right in that moment, as Moses is kind of the mediator between God and the people, Moses says this to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. In other words, Moses looks at God and says, we would rather die here in the middle of the desert, in the middle of, the desert of dehydration and starvation than have all the luxury and excess and freedom imaginable in the promised land. If you don't go, we won't go. This is not just delight and desire. This is desperation. As a church, we want to be a people. Not just as a community. We want you to be a person who has a priority of worship. Who isn't living a fragmented, distracted, pulled apart life. But you are focused. And with a controlling center, God is at the core of everything you do. And you've learned to delight in him, to desire him, and even to grow in desperation for him above all else. I want to go back to the life of Mary, the story that 
began our, our time today. Because Mary shows up three times in the Gospels. If you look at Jesus' interaction with Mary, you'll see obviously the story that we began with in Luke chapter 10. But there's two other very significant stories that happen in her life. And I believe that it was the heart of worship that Mary embodied and expressed in Luke 10 that set the stage for the type of experience that she had with Jesus in the other two encounters. The other two times we see her, the first is in John chapter 11. John chapter 11, Jesus comes to Bethany where Martha, Mary, and Lazarus lived because Lazarus had died. And he'd been dead for four days and Jesus shows up and Jesus talks to Martha and Martha's like, if you were here, he wouldn't have died. And then Jesus goes on to give Martha a lesson in theology about Jesus being the resurrection and the life and those who believe in him will, will, will never die. But then Mary comes out. And Mary comes out and approaches Jesus and she is sobbing. And it seems as though when Jesus saw Mary and saw her tears and saw her broken heartedness, a chord was struck in his own heart. And he began to weep as well. And after seeing the tears of this woman who adored him, who, who, who worshipped him, who centered her life on him and was focused on him, after seeing her tears, he then said, tell these men to roll that stone away. And he spoke and he said, Lazarus, come out. And her brother was brought back from the grave. And I believe it all sprung forth from that heart of worship that Mary embodied in her devotion to Jesus. The next time that we see Mary is in the following chapter, John chapter 12. Jesus is now in the final week of his life. He's reclining at table. He's, he's, he's eating a meal with his disciples and Mary approaches the room. This time not to sit at his feet and learn like, like, like before. She has an alabaster jar representing what is likely her entire net worth. It's valued at over a full year's wages, tens of thousands of dollars in modern currency. And Mary takes it to the presence of Jesus. She shatters the jar and she lavishes it upon his body. And the disciples are there and they're so confused and they're kind of angry and they're snickering a little bit. What a, what a, what a waste! Why would someone do this? The, 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 this could have been sold and the money given to the poor and it would have actually helped people out in a practical way. And Jesus hears what's going on and he silences them. And he says, enough of that nonsense. This woman is the only person in the entire room that understands what's going on. She knows I'm about to die because she paid attention when I spoke. And she has poured this perfume on my body to prepare me for my burial. And then he said, throughout the entire world, whenever my story is proclaimed, what she has done will be told as well. There is something about her devotion to Christ. There is something about her focused commitment, her heart of worship, living with Jesus at the center that allowed her story to become an intricate part of the story of Jesus himself. Don't you want that to be true of you? Don't you want to live with a sort of Luke 10 focus and devotion and passion and commitment that you end up seeing the door to miracles unlock and swing wide open in your life? Don't you want to, not in a self-serving type way, not in a self-exalting type way, but don't you want to live with a sort of worship and devotion that opens the door to allow your testimony and the testimony of Jesus to be woven together because of your passion? We're a church with seven priorities. We're a church that does everything we can to make disciples. And we want you to be a disciple that worships Jesus, that pursues his presence and his honor in everything you do. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the incredible window into worship that we see in the life of Mary and in these Psalms. We want to be people who live with you at the center of our lives. We want to be people who delight in you, who desire you. God, grow our desperation for you. 
This isn't something that has to be crammed down our throats. This is something that we want to taste and see that you are good and then put you above and before everything else. Lord, might this be true of us as a church? Yes, of course. But every woman and every man who's, who's here today, God, might this be our story. We worship you. You are not just real and powerful. You are good. You are beautiful. We desire you. And God, where we don't want you enough, grow our longing for your presence and your glory. We ask it in the powerful name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I want to invite you to respond in one of a few ways. Uh, First, I want to open up uh, the doors to the porch. And if you would like to place Jesus at the center of your life. If you would like to make Jesus your treasure today, please meet us at the porch. We'd love to help you make that life-changing decision. Perhaps you've had a hard week. You've got a difficult diagnosis. There's a burden that has been weighing you down, and you would just like to be able to have an extended conversation with a trustworthy, godly person and be able to to pray with them. Again, the porch is the place for you. Also, also our time to receive communion and to uh, give our, our tithes and offerings. So if you haven't already, you can make your way around the worship center and you can take the elements and receive the cup, the juice and the blood, and say, God, I'm going to to eat your flesh. I'm going to drink your blood. I will center my life on you and put you at the very center, very very core of of my life. I also want to invite you, if you want to um, respond with with an increased cry for worship to be the hallmark of your life, I would invite you after communion to just come forward to the front of the worship center and just maybe just extend your hands and say, God, I want this to be true of me more so tomorrow than it is today. I want worship to be the priority of my life. I'm guessing if you come forward, you won't be up here alone. And you can just say, God, I want to be a woman. I want to be a man who lives a life of worship. I believe that when men and women come forward in a moment like this and cry out to God, he hears and he responds, and this might be that, that best next step that you can take to say worship will be a priority in my life. You have a few moments right now. You have plenty of space and time. Respond as the Lord leads. <laughs>